Kate Riley learns she has a dangerous stalker who is willing to murder for her in his obsession. When she is sure no one around her is safe, she escapes to another town. She dares to fall in love, but is she safe from her stalker there? Kate is a regular at a coffee place in Portland, where she places an order. As she sips her coffee and works, someone is watching her and taking notes of her schedule. When Kate throws her cup in the trash at the end of the day, the stalker picks it up. The stalker has a lot of pictures of her, and a huge collection of all her coffee cups and her hair. Kate walks in the rain, but feels like someone is following her. She keeps walking and reaches her house, where a hooded figure arrives at the same time. She collects her mail, but notices one of them is for her neighbor Nick, so she knocks on his door. Nick is pleased to see her and asks about her dinner plans. Kate wants to finish her homework, but agrees she needs to eat, and would like the company. As they head down the stairs, Kate suggests a new cafe she spotted. The hooded figure waits for them to leave before he reaches Kate's house and breaks in. He looks around and notices a book in her bag. Kate is back from dinner and is about to sleep when she hears a knock, assuming it's Nick. As the knocking continues, she opens her door to check, but doesn't find anyone. When she looks down, she spots a purple rose with blood on it. She panics and knocks on Nick's door, who lets her in to discuss the issue. Nick feels the rose might be from a secret admirer, but Kate knows the blood part is very creepy. She realizes that she was reading the book, The Purple Rose, and this rose is exactly like the one on the cover. Kate works for Mags in the bookstore, who can tell Kate is tired, and asks her about it. Mags thinks Kate has met someone, and informs her about a man who came to the store earlier to ask about a book Kate was reading. She couldn't see his face since he was wearing a cap, but he didn't look like a student or one of Kate's friends. Kate reaches home to find another purple rose outside her door, but she doesn't touch it. When Nick doesn't respond, she walks away, but keeps calling Nick, whose phone keeps buzzing inside the house. Kate meets Detective Mark Payne, and informs him about the roses and being stalked. She brings him to her house, but the rose is gone. Payne asks if someone might know about it, and they both start knocking at Nick's door. Since he doesn't respond, and Payne doesn't have evidence, he asks her to call him at the station if there is any progress. Kate locks the bookstore when people leave and heads inside. It suddenly gets dark, and she hears a man's voice asking her to not be afraid. Kate asks the man to face her, but he is not ready yet. He asks if she likes his surprises, so Kate tries to run away. She is too slow, and he drags her by her hair to a shelf. He is angry about her trying to get away from him, and touches her inappropriately on the face. Kate tries pushing him away, but he's too powerful, and throws her to the ground. He bends down to whisper in her ear, and takes out a knife to cut a lock of her hair. He is waiting for the right time so she notices him, and leaves her there on the ground, trembling. A police officer takes Kate's statement, but she gets irritated by all the questioning. Kate wants to go home, so the officer asks his subordinate, Officer Frank Dower, to take her. Kate hesitates before entering the house, so Frank offers to check inside. Frank looks around and smiles, pocketing a scarf lying on her desk. We know he is the stalker from his eyes, and he begins to leave, after insisting that her house looks clear. Under her house, Frank smiles and sniffs her scarf. Kate goes to Nick's bar to check if he's there, but learns from his friend that he is missing. She turns to go back, but an old man stops her and asks her to grab a drink with him. When she refuses, his abuses her and tries to force her. A hooded figure comes and punches the man, but leaves before Kate can thank him. At the bookstore, Mags checks up on Kate, but she doesn't want everyone to be worried. Payne arrives and asks to speak to Kate. He wonders if Kate thinks Nick could be her stalker, but Kate is sure Nick is her friend, and is also worried, since he seems to be missing. Payne agrees to not bring Nick up, and promises to send a team to look for him. Payne insists she always needs to carry pepper spray, and not be alone. Kate doesn't have any family or friends, because she grew up in the foster system. That night, as Kate sleeps, she imagines the stalker's masked face next to her. She wakes up in terror, but realizes she is alone. Kate walks out of the library in the morning and spots Payne waiting for her. Payne shows her a picture of the old man from the bar, and asks if she recognizes him. She recalls how he was being sleazy with her, and asks if he is the stalker. Payne informs her that his body was found with his throat slashed behind the bar, with a note addressed to Kate, and a purple rose. Kate starts to feel sick, while Frank watches this from a distance and laughs. Payne introduces Kate to detectives Jake Marsh, Ben Jones, and Bill Hansen. When they are settled, Payne asks her to recall the incident, and Kate suddenly remembers another detail. She knows the hooded figure who punched the guy and left must have been her stalker. She couldn't see his face since it was too dark and he was wearing a cap. Kate starts panicking, since she feels someone lost his life because of her. Payne knows the stalker is more dangerous than they thought, and assigns the team of the three detectives in the room to follow her. Kate notices a file on Nick, and asks if Payne still suspects him. Payne knows they can't rule him out until he is found. They are looking for him, and found his apartment with all items untouched. When Kate learns his earphones were there too, she is sure the stalker murdered Nick, since he doesn't go anywhere without his music. Payne promises to look into it, but makes her understand that her safety is their greatest priority. He insists that only the four people in the room will be on her case, and anyone who claims they are filling in for them is lying. From then, Bill starts walking with her from the coffee shop, and Ben helps her cook. 
Jake even attends the classes with her, but falls asleep, which Frank watches from behind them. In the coffee shop, Kate asks when the professor said her paper is due, and Jake jokes around with her. Payne walks in and insists that since they don't have a single lead on the stalker, and it has been two months, the department is pulling them out. Kate feels like they might have scared the stalker off, but Jake knows guys like that don't back down so easily. Jake asks for special permission to protect Kate, but she wants everyone to go back to their normal lives. Since she still has some days with them, she asks them to give her a gun and some self-defense lessons. While arranging books, Kate hears a noise and gets scared. She is relieved when a girl comes in asking for a book. Kate offers to get it for her, and while she does, Frank lurks around the store. Kate hands over the book and starts locking up the place. It suddenly goes dark again, and she hears her stalker's voice from behind. He grabs her by the waist and holds her against the cupboard by her neck. He creepily touches her hair again, and asks if she missed him. Kate decides to play along so he lets her go, and she manages to put some distance between them. Frank only wants her because he feels she is different from other women. Kate reaches for her purse, but Frank already knows her gun is not there. He drags her by the legs, but she tries to fight him. He still overpowers her, and apologizes for yelling at her, with a knife around her neck. He forces her to turn around to look at him. He is in awe of her beauty, but it gets more disturbing very soon. He starts cutting her buttons with his knife as she protests, and carves something on her chest as she cries out in pain. But that's not enough, so he also drops the blood from the knife on her face and licks it. He is finally happy that she is marked, and no other man will want her. He also warns Kate to keep her cop friends away, since he finds out everything. He thinks that by murdering them too, if needed, he is taking care of her. Kate is shocked and unable to protest, and soon passes out from the blood loss. Kate wakes up in the hospital surrounded by the detectives, but she is scared for their lives too, and asks them to leave. They stay put, and Payne asks her to explain what happened. Kate narrates the incident, and that the stalker admitted to murdering Nick. She tearfully informs them about the huge mark on her chest too, which makes Jake very angry. One morning in the hospital, Kate notices a purple rose in her breakfast. She is scared, but also determined to not let her cop friends get hurt, so she flushes it away. She then asks Jake to come in, and pretends everything is fine. Kate is about to get discharged the next day, and all the detectives are very excited. Ben comes to pick her up just before she is getting discharged, and Kate asks him to get a muffin for her. When he's away, Kate quickly picks up her bags and leaves town on a bus. One year later, in Green Bluff, Wyoming, Kate is working at a bar when she hears some men causing a commotion. She intervenes, but one of them starts abusing her and tries to touch her inappropriately. But she is trained at this point, and knocks the guy down. Since it doesn't keep him down, Jack, who is a regular at the bar, asks the men to apologize to her. This starts an argument, which Kate breaks up, and the men leave. Kate is upset with Jack, since she feels she could have handled this herself. Kate's colleague knows Jack is interested in her, and has asked Kate out so many times. Kate doesn't want to discuss this, but goes to take his order and thanks him for helping out. At home, she calls Payne to casually inform him about the bar fight, but Payne tries to get her location instead. Kate is sure everyone is safer if no one knows where she is. Payne puts her on speaker, and Kate teases all the guys about working late. Ben feels they should inform Kate about what the stalker is doing, but Payne refuses to involve her yet. Frank is frustrated about Kate running away, but talks to himself about being determined to find her. Kate bumps into Jack while taking pictures, and he asks her about photography. He suggests that she can get some great shots of a waterfall nearby. Kate doesn't have a car, so Jack offers to take her. Kate feels like she doesn't know Jack enough, so he has to remind her that he is a regular at the bar. Kate is clear about this not being a date, and Jack promises to be on his best behavior. Kate is satisfied, and heads to her apartment to get a different lens, but also grabs a gun. Kate is nervous as she sits in her car, so Jack tries his best to make her feel comfortable. They stop at a place near the waterfall, and need to walk into the woods for the rest of the distance. Kate is afraid of going there with a stranger, so she asks to make a quick call. Kate informs Payne about her trip, without giving any details about the location. Payne feels Kate is being irresponsible with this, which Frank also overhears. Kate assures Payne that she knows Jack, but refuses to give a full name so he can't track them. Payne doesn't know how he can keep her safe if he doesn't know where she is, so Care promises to keep calling every two hours. When Kate gets back to the car, she gets scared when Jack tries to reach for a bag, but pretends it's nothing to worry about. On their way, Jack asks if the friend on the phone taught her how to fight in a bar with guys twice her size. He thinks Kate is very mysterious, but nothing can make her reveal her secret at this point. Jack prepares a picnic spot when Kate comes back from the waterfall. When he brings out some candles along with the food, Kate makes sure to remind him that this is not a date. Kate learns that Jack has a supposedly boring life, running a ranch with his sister and her husband. Kate only reveals that she grew up in the foster system. Jack is still eager to share his story, and informs her about horses on his ranch, and offers to take her for a ride there sometime. Kate learns that Jack used to be a cop, but took retirement after his parents passed away. Kate is happy to be with him, and asks him to hand her the camera when she finds the perfect lighting. 
Jack teases her and starts taking pictures of her instead. He moves towards her to make an adjustment for the photo, and kisses her. Jack walks Kate back to the door, and since she feels the same way, Kate kisses him again before heading home. Frank follows a woman on the street and starts running after her. He slits her throat, and the detectives find her body the next morning, with a note and a purple rose. Payne knows it's now time to inform Kate about these murders. He feels better when Ben suggests they can get Kate back, and keep her safe while setting a trap for the stalker. Jack takes Kate to his ranch, where she meets his sister Avery. Jack wants to show Kate around, and offers to teach her how to ride a truck. Kate doesn't know how to even drive a car, so Jack is convinced he needs to teach her. Jack is very sweet to Kate, even when she crashes into a fence. Kate feels very embarrassed, but Jack still seems positive. They walk back and end up on a swing. Kate shares her dream of the perfect couple adopting her when she was young, so she could run around a big house like this one, with dogs. They're glad to spend time with each other, and Jack even takes her boating. He brings Kate to his workshop, which was built by his dad, and they kiss. It starts to pour outside, and as Kate and Jack start running to get shelter, Frank murders another woman. The light goes off, and Jack gets a lamp to search for Kate. He finally finds her in a corner, holding a gun in her hand and trembling in the dark. Jack approaches her calmly, but Kate is still panicking, so she fires a shot. Jack takes care of her, and assures her that she is safe. Kate approaches the window and finally starts telling her story. Jack learns she's from Portland, where a stalker is waiting for her. She informs him about the day the detectives weren't with her, and he attacked her. She slowly unbuttons her shirt and shows him the mark he left on her chest, so no man would want her. Jack feels terrible about everything she has had to go through, and assures his full support in keeping her safe. Kate is still scared, because she knows that everyone close to her gets hurt. Jack isn't afraid, and is sure that he wants to be with Kate. She explains that her stalker has resources, so if she stays in a place for long, or leaves a trail, he will find her. Kate doesn't think she can afford to fall in love in a situation like this. Jack is just happy she loves him too, and asks her to not be ashamed, since he loves every part of her. He kisses her on her chest, and she takes him to her room. Meanwhile, Payne struggles to find the best way to inform Kate about the stalker. He thinks it is weird that their suspect never leaves a trace of evidence. Jake suggests that this could be because the stalker is a cop, since he knows everything too. Kate hears her phone buzzing, but can't find it anywhere. Jack teases her about trying to leave him, but she wants to answer the call if it is from Payne. Kate clarifies that no one knows her location, including the cops, because she doesn't want to endanger them too. She knows the stalker will find out somehow, and come for her. Jack finds her phone and gives it to Kate. Payne puts her on speaker with the other detectives, and insists there is something he can only tell her in person. Payne wants her location, but Kate knows she can never reveal it. She informs them about another person in her life now, Jack, who is very important to her. Kate is not willing to risk her location, and knows she's only safe if she's hidden. Payne finally reveals that the stalker is murdering women, and they know it's him because of the purple roses. Kate learns he has taken the lives of six women in six months, all with notes addressed to her. Kate is shocked, so Jack takes the phone from her to ask Payne to explain what is happening. Kate recovers and wants to talk to Payne again. She knows the stalker is doing this to lure her back, and he has succeeded, because she has decided to go back to Portland. Jack refuses to let her put herself in danger like that. He taunts Payne and the detectives for not taking better care of her. When Kate is sure she has to go back, Jack announces that he'll go with her. He reminds Kate he was a cop too. This alerts Payne, and he writes something down while Kate and Jack keep quarreling. Kate agrees to let Jack come if he works with Payne and the others. Payne asks to speak to Jack, so he can get some details from him. Jack reveals his full name, agency number, and that he was a cop for 10 years. They look for Jack in the system and confirm his identity, and find out that he's in Wyoming. Payne then informs Jack that her stalker is also a cop, which is why they need to be more careful. Payne wants to make sure that Jack can protect her. Jack assures Payne that he wants the stalker found as much as they do, and will do anything so Kate feels safe again. Payne feels reassured, and asks him to inform Kate that he will come up with a plan. Kate feels bad about everything that's happening, but Jack assures her that she did it to protect herself. That night, Frank peeps into the office and finds Jack's information open on the computer. Jack meets Kate, and informs her that all the detectives are positioned in their car outside the restaurant, and will recognize anyone from Portland Police Department. He takes her in, and when Jack comes back, he informs her that the area is clear, and he knows everyone there. Jack assures her that he will keep out of sight, and will be right outside. He gives her a passionate kiss before leaving, knowing that he will do anything to keep her safe. Just when Jack steps out, Frank sneaks inside in a cowboy hat with some others, and Jack informs the officers that everything is all clear inside the bar. All the cops are sitting alert, and even Kate starts working at the bar. The cops know that the stalker is desperate, and has been looking for Kate for over a year, so he will make sure to be there to see her that night. They all keep waiting, and Jack holds on tightly to his phone. Soon, it's only 10 minutes till closing time, and the owner, Gus, informs Kate about locking up from the front. The cops start getting alert, while Kate also nervously keeps on working. 
Kate approaches the last customer there and gives him the check. Frank takes off his hat to finally show his face, and Kate feels like he looks familiar. He reminds her that he dropped her home once. As Kate starts to connect the dots and looks at him with horror, Frank knows she has finally noticed him. She tries to run away, but Frank grabs her and starts smelling her hair. He is upset with Kate for ruining the special connection they had by being involved with Jack. He admits she tricked him by running away, but thinks she will pay for it now. He asks her to get up, but Kate starts laughing. She finds it funny that he kept to the shadows and scared her, waiting for her to notice him. Now that she has, she feels there's nothing to notice, because he's a pathetic little man. Frank is now certain that he wants to end her, and takes out his knife. He asks Kate why she did this to him, after everything he did for her. Kate has to explain that he's sick enough to go around murdering women for his own ego. Since he has Kate in control, she pleads with him to leave Jack alone, and suggests that they can run away together. But Frank's mind has now changed, because he doesn't want Kate anymore, after she has already been with Jack. He feels she's not special anymore because she has slept with Jack, and he wants to stab her, just like he did to the others. Frank gets a lot more violent with her, but Kate screams out loud, and this alerts Jack. Right before Frank is about to stab her, Jack comes charging in and starts beating him up. He only stops when Kate asks him to, and the others have cornered Frank. Jake is surprised to recognize him, and Jack checks if Kate is okay, and tries to mend her cut. They are all happy that they finally got the stalker, and Kate officially introduces them to Jack. The detectives then arrest Frank and take him away. Kate sits on an interrogation table, but Jack wonders if Frank will confess anything. Payne feels they need to play on Frank's arrogance, since he thinks he's smarter than the cops. They just have him in for aggravated assault, but want the sentence to be longer, and they feel like Kate can get under his skin to confess to his crimes. Payne knows Frank still believes he can have Kate in some way. Jake brings Frank into the room, and he blows Kate a flying kiss when he sees her. Jake makes sure the handcuffs are secure, before he nods at Kate and leaves the room to join the other detectives outside. Frank is thrilled to see Kate, and feels like she couldn't stay away from him once she noticed him. Kate is firm, and insists she only wants to rub it in that they have managed to outsmart him. Frank knows they're trying to make him confess, so he keeps up his story, and pretends like he never mentioned murdering anyone to Kate. He suggests she must be delusional because of stress. He compliments Kate, but wants her to know she's not smarter than him. Kate starts using tactics to get under his skin and insists that the murderer who left these notes must be stupid, since it seems like he was begging to get caught. Frank still maintains his cool, but suggests that the murderer is brilliant because he didn't leave any evidence. Kate's persistence almost makes Frank crack, but he still talks about the murderer in third person by suggesting how smart the person is to have slain these women under the cops' noses. He tries to attack Kate instead by asking if she has heard from her friend Nick yet. Kate then uses her trump card and starts crying, which stirs a reaction from Frank. It turns into something else for Frank when Kate suggests that the Slayer couldn't get hard till the women were corpses. Kate is now in the mood, and discusses a running joke around the police station, which Frank wouldn't have heard since he doesn't have any friends. This starts agitating Frank, especially when Kate keeps hurting his ego by suggesting that she feels sorry for the murderer, because he had sex with all the women after they were deceased. This finally brings the reaction from Frank they were hoping for, since he automatically confesses that he could have done anything with the women when they were alive, but he wouldn't do that, since he is a good man. He also suggests that he will have Kate once he gets out, and come for her. Kate knows they have the confession they wanted, and reminds Frank that till he's locked up, he will look at the scar on his face and always remember her, since he's the one who is marked now. Months later, it's finally Christmas for Jack and Kate, who celebrate it with all the detectives, happy that the man who terrorized Kate is finally behind bars for good. 